back to around 10 above zero, maybe even a couple of degrees colder than that in some locations. Mostly sunny on Tuesday, kind of breezy, especially at the coast, with a high just 25. It'll be clear Tuesday night, lows will be in the mid-teens, and those temperatures may climb a little bit after midnight. And we're set for a milder day Wednesday. Sunshine with a high of 40. Correcting to mostly sunny on Thursday with a high in the low 40s. I'm meteorologist Rob St. Pierre for your next way weather in 30 minutes. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Tim Coco, and this is the Open Mic Show. Chris Porter is producing in Master Control. Welcome back, Chris, after a couple weeks off. All right, last week, uh, Haverhill Community Television Channel 22 was on vacation. As such, we decided to take the week off as well. Tonight on the program, just after the news at 7 o'clock, Reverend Frank Clarkson from the Universalist Unitarian Church of Haverhill will be here in the studio uh, to discuss the recent incident of vandalism at the church where uh, someone or several people removed from the church uh, ripped down, in fact, a banner, uh, the Black Lives Banner at uh, Haver at uh, the Universalist Unitarian Church. Chris, could you call Channel 22 and see uh, maybe they'll actually put us on. So Reverend Clarkson will be here, and uh, it's a good time to address some, some myths and misconceptions about the Black Lives Matters movement, and we'll discuss some of those. I'll also read to you some comments from WHAV listeners and viewers. We are taking this month, February, February birthdays and anniversaries here on the Open Mic Show. All you have to do is wish someone a happy birthday or a couple a happy anniversary on the air. Chris will take their names. You will make the greeting on air, and uh, the recipient will become eligible for a free 7-inch cake from LBD's second-generation Italian bakery, 140 South Main Street in Bradford. Uh, it's a wonderful treat. Choice of vanilla or chocolate, so very easy contest. Uh, the odds, as Jack Bevelock, we used to say here on this program, better than the lottery, much better. Uh, usually there, there are fewer than a dozen entries. Uh, one is drawn the last Monday of the month. So again, call 978-374-1900. Wish someone a happy birthday or a couple a happy anniversary uh, that is celebrating in February. We're always one month ahead, and then we will uh, draw the winner the last Monday of the month. You can watch the Open Mic Show for the next two hours at whav.tv on your computer or smartphone. And with some luck, you'll be able to watch it on Channel 22, Haverhill Community Television, HC Media, in Haverhill. Chris is placing a call to them. You've done that. Okay. And and uh, they'll do the, the best they can, I guess, to get us on. You can also listen to WHAV 24 hours a day, seven days a week at whav.net on your computer or smartphone. You can also listen on AM radio, AM 1640, and on cable television, usually the sound behind those community announcements in Andover Channel 8, Haverhill Channel 99. Again, that is a change. It used to be uh, the background sound on Channel 22, although open mic is still on 22 sometimes. Uh, it, uh, the audio uh, in the background is now on the education channel, Channel 99. Also in Methuen, Channels 8 and 22 on Comcast, Channel 32 on Verizon Fios, Plasto, Channels 17, and or 23, Sandown, Channel 17. Again, 
Also, if you have an Apple TV, maybe you've received one as a gift. If you have an Apple TV, you can go to the radio button and you'll find WHAV under Golden Oldies on your Apple TV. If you have a Roku box, you should have an application called TuneIn. Again, you can search and listen to WHAV there and on many other appliances that use the TuneIn. FM. 97.9 uh, coming soon we hope with your help if you uh, would like to make a contribution to help WHAV a nonprofit organization kick off the year feel free to call Chris our producer and make a pledge uh, or you can uh, become a member ten dollars for students of senior citizens twenty five dollars uh, regular membership and up Chris will give you the information call him at nine seven eight three seven four. 1900. If you'd like to peruse on your own, you can go to WHAV's website, whav.net. Anywhere you see Tom Bergeron's photo, Tom got his start here in 1972, you can click there to make a uh, contribution to the Make Waves campaign. Make Waves bring local news to FM. Okay, now that Channel 22 has uh, joined us, just a reminder, Reverend Frank Clarkson from the Universalist Unitarian Church of Haverhill will be on the program after the news at 7 o'clock. He is going to uh, discuss uh, the, the vandalism at the church that resulted in the removal of a Black Lives Matter banner uh, on the church and he will also address uh, perhaps some of the myths surrounding Black Lives Matter. In a minute, we'll discuss some of the comments we received at whab.net. And uh, I will tell you about the research that I conducted uh, into uh, the origins of some of these myths. I'll give you a sneak preview. It looks like uh, many of the comments that have been made, such as Black Lives Matter is a hate group, uh, is actually only the opinion of Bill O'Reilly at Fox News. Uh, no organization has deemed uh, Black Lives Matter a uh, hate group. Uh, it does not advocate the uh, killing of police or anyone like that. These are myths and misconceptions that all seem to have their origin on Fox News. Now, there may be some legitimate arguments. Uh, I think the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign uh, were certainly uh, well, confused when Black Lives Matter interrupted Bernie at an event during a campaign. I would think that no one running for president, whether Republican or Democrat, uh, more is aligned with the principles of Black Lives Matter than uh, Bernie Sanders. By the way, he was in Plasto, New Hampshire yesterday. Did any of you uh, get to see Bernie Sanders? I think it's about as close as we've come yet to having a um, presidential candidate in WHAV's listener area. So maybe you'd like to comment on that. All right, some, some breaking news. Um, just a few minutes ago, WHAV's uh, website, whav.net, uh, posted news about a road rage incident today on uh, 495 and into Haverhill proper. Uh, you'll hear more about that on the news tonight with Dana Esmol. Uh, but what appears to have happened is a uh, some type of incident on Route 495. Uh, a man uh, followed a woman who uh, apparently uh, did not like something about uh, what happened on the highway. He followed her off 495, off uh, exit 51, down Primrose Street. Uh, finally, when she came to a stop, he came out and, according to police, um, uh, brandished a black handgun. And uh, that uh, that will be coming up on the news. Actually, Dana Esmel is here. Dana, is that on the next one or the 8 o'clock news, the incident of the handgun? Dana will check, but it's not really not that big a deal. Either on the 7 or 8 o'clock news, uh, you'll hear Dana Esmo, who's in the studio tonight, uh, discussing uh, what happened today on 495. Police say the man pulled a black handgun and what appears to be a road rage incident. Some great detective work, apparently, by patrolman Kevin Lynch. Uh, the police were able to arrest the man, I, I think. 
uh, off the top of my head, he's either 64 or 66 years old, a little older than, than one would expect for uh, a case like that. Also, this morning, uh, the inauguration of city officials, uh, Andrew Vargas and uh, Andy Vargas and Joseph Bevilacqua have joined the Haverhill City Council. Uh, Bill Ryan and uh, Bob Scatamaccia have left the city council. And a mystery was cleared up late this afternoon. You'll also hear this on WHAV News. Joe Bevilacqua will resign from the Haverhill School Committee after all. Uh, he had said he would in the very beginning, that he would not serve in both positions, the city council and the school committee. Uh, but uh, at some point, uh, there seemed to be a little bit of a cloud over that decision. My, my, I have some speculation as to what that was, and we can talk more about that later. Other news today, former Mayor John Guerin is going to be heading the commission studying the salaries of elected officials and will make a recommendation to the mayor. Uh, let's see, we have about four minutes to our, our first break, which is this day in Massachusetts history. So let's go to the phones right away. And I believe we have Brian on the line. You are correct. All right, Brian, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. All right, so what is on your mind, or do you have a... Brian, by the way, has submitted the cake winner's names for, I don't know, the last four or five months. That's uh, right. And even, now, there's competition, but somehow the uh, the odds have been in his favor, maybe about time, some would say. Uh, but, uh, so, Brian, uh, what do you have for us tonight? I have another birthday. My goodness. <laughs> all right, so why don't we just give the cake to this person right now and just forget <laughs> about it? No, no, it's all right. No, there's well, still a contest. Well, the fact is... This person was selected last year, but he never got the thing. I'm, I'm suspecting that maybe his secretary thought it was junk mail. And oh, is this know. the one you told me about an email? Yep. Because I do know that we did catch up, and certainly not. We may be a little behind, but not a year behind. Oh, and by the way, um, in, in our, just so you know, Brian, just so you know what we're doing to make sure that these go out in a more timely fashion, uh, I don't want to embarrass her, so I'll just use her first name until I get permission. But uh, WHAV put out a recent request for volunteer help, and Laurie yeah. uh, stepped up. And there, uh, there are several others who are also looking to help, and there's certainly plenty to do around here, like mailing out the prize winners' prizes. So uh, we welcome aboard Laurie who's observing tonight so she can see what it is that happens after we write the winner's name down and then it never goes out. <laughs> well, I know my friend from uh, the December birthday was still waiting, and I haven't talked to him in a few days. So. All right, so Chris is laughing at that, saying, yeah, there it is, Coco again. Yeah, he can uh, talk into a microphone, but ask him to put a stamp on an envelope, and he fails. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, who's the birthday wish for? Frank. All right. Frank's birthday is in February. What day? 16th. 16th. All right. So um, if Frank should be the winner at uh, the end of the month when we're drawing, uh, make sure that uh, you do whatever you can, Brian, to remind him uh, that a letter will come. It'll look like junk mail. It'll look like a solicitation. But in fact, as thin as that envelope is, it actually contains a seven-inch cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'll call the secretary. You know, he's got a, a medical office uh, in Bradford across from the bakery. and uh, So it's very convenient for him to go to oh, LBD's yeah. second-generation Italian bakery, 140 South Main Street. Amazing how I worked that in there unsuspectingly, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any thoughts from you before we go to break about uh, some of the news items today? Joe Bevilacqua will step down from school committee after all. He says he's keeping his word. I have a theory as to why he uh, decided to let this become a, a matter of debate. Uh, what do you think, Brian? Well, I'm just hearing this now for the first time. Well, that's because WHAV News is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's <laughs> always Another free. What's that? That's another plug. I know. It's amazing how it can just roll them off like this. And it is free. <laughs> yes. It is free. If you want Haverhill News any other way, you're going to have to pay. Uh, Chris, make sure you record that. We'll put that in the next <laughs> promo. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, of course, is an old radio hand himself. 
at WRAZ at Northern Essex Community College. How's that for you? Radio. I can work that one in, too. <laughs> Expect more at Northern Essex. What? A.M. and P.M. Yeah, that's right. A.M. and P.M. All right. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. So um, what was your thought? Uh, my thought? No, I don't have any thoughts. Actually, you know what, though? I mean, recently uh, they had a thing on the news about, you know, they're reviewing everything from uh, 2015, and they, they mentioned that uh, Skagel, uh, the, you know, the one who was uh, convicted for the murder of one teenage uh, Martha Moxley back in 1975. Way back when, yes. And um, I didn't realize that he was out on bail. Oh, okay, yeah. And that's just, I don't know what, if any, restrictions uh, he's under, but he's trying to get a new trial because uh, I, I believe, you know, when I read it a long time ago, it said he felt that his legal representation was inadequate. Uh, that is a defense sometimes in getting a case open, but he's out now, right? So w what is this, just he's to clear the record? Bail, yeah, and I'm, and I'm thinking, gee, if I wanted to get out on bail, I'd say, well, I don't like the legal representation that I had. But is he, on, is he on bail because of that, or was he on parole anyway? No, he wasn't on parole. Oh, okay. So, now this is, of course, it's not a local story, but uh, undoubtedly uh, it appears in some of the news feeds we have. All right, well, that's interesting. Uh, also, what did you think, uh, I don't know if you heard it uh, tonight, uh, I don't know if Havel TV was on yet, but uh, we had an incident uh, where a man was arrested this afternoon after an uh, apparent road rage incident that took place this morning. He followed, uh, allegedly followed uh, the woman home uh, from the highway and uh, pointed a black handgun at her. Luckily, there were witnesses who were able to get some information, and uh, police uh, patrolman uh, Kevin Lynch was able to track down the person at his home, and he is under arrest tonight. Yeah. People do seem to lose their temper a lot, don't they? Uh, yeah, and what they do when they have their temper. <laughs> well, I just and it was, we're presuming a real gun anyway. It looked like one, huh? Uh, the police actually have gone so far, I don't, I'm not sure I have it in front of me, but have uh, identified a number of weapons charges, so it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a toy, uh. which is uh, just kind of scary in, it, in itself. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. And then uh, former Mayor John Guerin, and I, I, I know, Brian, this doesn't help you much, but uh, others, uh, the photograph on WHAV's website is of John Guerin when he filled in as host of the open mic show uh, when Jack Bevilacqua was out some time ago. Uh -huh. And uh, John is going to be uh, heading a commission, he was named by Mayor Fiorentini, to uh, head a commission to study the salaries of elected officials. Uh -huh. so. All right, well, Brian, I hope you'll tune in for Reverend Coxon tonight. And, yeah. and other topics. Well. And thank you for calling in the birthday wish for Frank. And I'll have more next week. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Make sure that we keep it going here on whhav.net. Uh, we're running tape. We got you. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good have night. Good evening. Good night, Brian. Bye-bye. All right. Let's take a, a brief break. This hour we're going to hear about Today in Massachusetts History on Mass Moments. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978 374 1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not for profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. This spot could have been yours. Support WHAV's local approach with your underwriting. Go to WHAV.net and click on advertising to reach thousands of new customers. Catch the wave! Those political sound bites you hear on the news are, at best, incomplete and could be misleading or even outright lies. This is David Pakman. Take time to delve into the truth by listening to The David Pakman Show, Tuesday through Friday nights at 8 on WHAV. 
Lack of logic and reason are exposed on The David Pakman Show as newsmakers collapse under cross-examination. Remember, only local radio can bring you this talk opportunity, but only WHAV does. Today is January 4th. On this day in 1884, Henry Haskell Liu was born in Lowell to a family that had long been active in the struggle for racial equality. Known from childhood as Bucky, he made his mark as the first African-American to play professional basketball. After leading the local YMCA team to a Merrimack Valley Championship, he played defense for the Pawtucketville Athletic Club in the New England Basketball League. When the league folded, Lou stayed in the game, working as a player and general manager for his own Lowell-based teams. In 1928, he moved to Springfield, one of the pioneers of basketball, He has never been inducted into the Hall of Fame, located just a few miles from where he spent the last 35 years of his life. For more about Bucky Lou, go online to massmoments.org. This Massachusetts Moment has been brought to you by the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. Uh, If you are a business owner or you work for a local business owner, keep in mind that the first hour of the Open Mic Show is available for sponsorship. Uh, it is uh, no one here tonight is getting paid. Uh, the money is simply to pay for things like the streaming royalties and the services like our networks, FSN and Pacifica, and it helps uh, pay for uh, some of the equipment. And if we ever had a surplus, we could put it toward building our new FM. So if you know someone in business, uh, the Open Mic Show has an enormous number of listeners on air, online, and on television. Uh, It's always been very, very popular, so uh, keep that in mind. Coming up in about eight minutes, Reverend Frank Clarkson from the Universalist Unitarian Church of Haverhill. He'll be here to discuss uh, some happenstances at the church where uh, someone or some people have removed a Black Lives uh, matter banner. Actually, Chris, maybe you can put that on the screen uh, as kind of a preview. Uh, the church did take a photograph of the banner when it was up. Uh, it was removed, uh, torn, actually, it's, uh, torn off the building, leaving leaving our, um, the grommets and uh, pieces of material. But uh, the church says, our faith calls us to affirm black lives matter. I want to read a a comment, and you're uh, welcome to call for uh, the next seven minutes until we go to news, 978-374-1900. WHAV, I'd say one of the most commented stories of the last week or so, uh, received a number of comments. And there's one, um, well, there's several here. We had several people um, who don't like Black Lives Matters, thinking uh, that it should be all lives matter. If you might recall, our Martin O'Malley presidential candidate made that comment and was nearly drowned out. And I have to say, the best the best response to this uh, we received was from a WHAV listener and reader named Robin. She said, oh, enough of this tedious straw man. If I say raspberry ice cream is t- Tasty. I'm not saying the other flavors are bad. There's no contradiction. So why so defensive? I thought that was a great response. Um, black Lives Matter simply making a statement that black lives matter, uh, that they're important and material just like all others are. And Robin made the point, if I say raspberry ice cream is tasty, I'm not saying the other flavors are bad. It's not a contradiction. Uh, 
She uh, she adds, find me one instance with a citation of anyone actually asserting the non-black lives don't matter and we can talk. But I think all of you, despite your hypersensitive self-pity, already know full well that nobody ever meant that. Of course, literally, all lives matter, but as the preacher above said perfectly, there's good reason to emphasize the black ones right now, because people keep killing black people routinely and casually in this country. Robin goes on, that doesn't just happen to white people in the same way, and despite all your whining, you know it. So she came back. Now, um, there are there are some comments, but we're going to go to the phones right now. We have about five minutes before the news. You are on the Open Mic Show. Hi, this is Greg over in Bradford. How are you doing, Tim? Hi, Greg. How are you? Actually, I keep seeing your name popping up on uh, a website. I hope, hope you don't mind my mentioning this, a website called I Love AM Radio. <laughs> Yes, I love AM radio and LPFM as well. (laughs) Great. Well, great. Happy New Year. Nice to hear from you again. Happy New Year. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Black Lives Matter. Well, I will agree all lives matter, but I understand the plight that is, you know, what's happening across the country. The only thing that I think that the group has going against it was the tactics that they used. Yeah, I mean, I think Bernie Sanders saw that. 93 at both ends in the middle of rush hour in endangered lives. Now, that's a a good point that uh, that another reader made. And that is certainly not a way to win. uh, Dale Carnegie's book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that's not the way to win friends and influence people. Now, do you have a sense that uh, this was just a... Uh, you know, apart from uh, from the national movement, or do you think maybe there's just some individual? Seems to me there was a hateful no, person. No, I think it, it was too orchestrated to be just a few individuals, and I believe it happened in other cities around the country. Okay, I, I don't know that. So I, this is one thing that, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, it forced Massachusetts, and let me tell you this, there is a difference between legitimate protest and legitimate civil disobedience. But when it crosses a line into endangering public safety and costing the citizens of the Commonwealth hundreds of thousands of dollars, then that's not civil disobedience, that's criminal activity. Well, I, w- I would say, Greg, that... Uh, and I'd like to know, you know, and that's, that's why I think they have a public relations image problem that they have to overcome. No, and I would say that you're making you're making a, you know a, a thoughtful, valid analysis. I do yes. think others are are frankly reacting uh, oversensitively to the term "Black Lives Matter." You've well, raised. I do agree with that. All right, you've but raised. You raised a valid not, point. I'm sorry. I think, unfortunately, their actions that they did last. I think it was February, March, April, May. I forget when it was the day they did that and the movement name unfortunately they're tied together well i mean i think um you know bernie sanders would agree with you uh of of all the candidates of either party i think most people would agree with me that bernie sanders is probably uh the most supportive uh, of the movement, and yet he was he was not able to speak because of a protest. So, uh, you know, I think these these are valid discussions. But some of the others, um, like hate group, uh, when you research where this came from, it wasn't like some national or international body made this designation. It was Bill O'Reilly on Fox News, certainly a less than credible source on this subject. Now, if Bill O'Reilly mentioned I-93 in Boston, maybe, but uh, he, um, uh, I don't think that what, uh, much of what we're seeing in comments is quoting Bill O'Reilly. So I'm not sure he's a great one to quote. Well, I think that, uh, I, I, I just think what happened, at least what they did in this area, and I don't know whether that was authorized by a national organization, but if I, if I remember correctly, this happened in other places in the country. And to affiliate that with Martin Luther King's civil disobedience or anything like that, Dr. King did not barricade a major highway at, at, at 8 in the morning. No, a valid, valid point. Risk. And I think that's what 
what they have to do, probably, if they want to gain any credibility, they have to immediately get up and disavow, apologize for what they did. And I haven't heard any apologies for that. Uh, well, maybe you'll agree with me on this, that no matter what, um, you know, <laughs> my father loved speaking in cliches, and uh, one of the things he would often say is, uh, two wrongs don't make a right, and uh, yep. tearing the banner off, not only the Haverhill, Universalist Unitarian Church, but uh, at least at last count, 17 other churches uh, certainly uh, cannot be uh, cannot be tolerated. I don't disagree with you. The two wrongs don't make a right. But if Black Lives Matter, I don't know if they're trying to depict themselves as being victims of the system, or you know, I honestly don't know. What, uh, who is going around ripping these down, but I think if they want to make their point, the first thing they should do is get up and uh, somehow they can't deny or disavow what they, they did in the I-93, you know, Somerville, and I think the other end of town, Milton, I think it was. They can't deny that this happened. No. But what they should do is get up and disavow any similar activity in the future and openly do that. All right. Kind of like the Irish Republican Army and Sinn Féin. If they want it to get their, you know, if they want to get their point across, they have to disavow, disavow actions that jeopardize the population of the community as a whole. Unfortunately, I didn't hear that, and when the, these people were taken into custody, I think they were rather proud of what they had done, and this is what uh, bothers me. This is what disturbs me about this group. All right. Well, I, I think I, I think that, you know again th that is a, a valid criticism. It's not coming from a racial bias. I think it that is that not. I think that that I think that's a valid point, and I think, like I said, yeah. Bernie Sanders would make another yes. point uh, similar to yours. Uh, so yeah. we appreciate we appreciate your Be your because fair. it was Italian Protestant Lives Matter, and they engaged in this behavior i would be i would be up there protesting i would be up there and disavowing anything as well so, all right well yeah. i appreciate the comments on that uh, and appreciate hearing from you again in the new year and i look forward to having you at the groundbreaking for whav's antenna matter of fact i may call you offline uh for maybe your help with our um our, our kind of pushing this a little bit off center Whatever you need. Uh, I appreciate it, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. I'll be listening. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Right. We have to go to local news now. WHAV News Director Dana Esmo with local news. Be sure to tune in to some of the, the more recent happenings in the last couple of hours. And then uh, Reverend Frank Clarkson from the Universalist Unitarian Church in Haverhill will be joining us. Stay tuned. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 7.03. WHAV LP Haverhill. WHAV is a nonprofit community service of Public Media of New England, Incorporated. Here's what's happening in local news. Breaking news this evening here on WHAV, newly sworn Haverhill City Councilor Joseph J. Bevilacqua has decided to, quote, keep my word and my commitment, end quote, by choosing to step down from his seat on the Haverhill School Committee. In a letter filed late this afternoon to City Clerk Linda L. Codalis, Bevilacqua said he had anticipated he would step down if elected to the council. However, quote, a number of people encouraged him to remain on the school committee while serving on the council. While permissible under law, he could only accept one salary from either panel. Quote, I have given this serious consideration in recognition of my role, contribution, and participation as a member of the school committee and the challenges before Haverhill that remain to continue to provide the best education possible for our school children, Bevilacqua said. 
Quote, however, I also recognize the most important thing an elected official has is his word, and I gave mine to the residents of Haverhill that I would step down if elected to the council. End quote. Bevilacqua's resignation from the school committee will be effective Friday, January 15, one day after the committee's scheduled first meeting of the new year. As WHAV reported last November, tradition suggests now former committee man Sean P. Tui, who finished in fourth place and did not win re-election, would be selected to complete the unexpired term. However, another former committee member, Susan Danahy, who did not run for another four-year term, said she would be interested in a two-year appointment to see the completion of the Hunking School project, quote, to the end. She remains a voting member on the Hunking School Building Committee. More details can be found at whav.net. Haverhill Mayor James J. Fiorentini, sworn into a seventh term this morning by U.S. Senator Edward J. Markey, said he seeks to make Haverhill, quote, a walkable city during his new term. To achieve this goal, he said, quote, it will take millions to fix the sidewalks in the city and millions more to build more. That is our challenge. But the Chinese have a saying, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. This year, I'll propose that we take the first step to become a more walkable city by investing more in our sidewalks than we have invested for decades, end quote. The mayor also recounted the city's situation as he said it existed during his first term. Quote, this is our time. Today we stand no longer at the brink of receivership. Today we stand on the brink of greatness and we are ready to build the city of tomorrow. But with every opportunity comes challenges, end quote. As expected, John A. Mitchison was elected president of the city council and Melinda E. Barrett was elected council vice president. Councilors typically name the two top vote getters to these leadership posts. City Councilor Joseph J. Bevilacqua says he will announce later today whether he plans to remain on the Haverhill School Committee. He told WHAV News that either way he will attend the first school committee meeting of the year. WHAV plans to present full coverage of the inauguration tomorrow. A Haverhill woman is due to be arraigned in district court after her arrest by Haverhill police on assault and other charges stemming from a reported disturbance late Sunday afternoon. Kimberly Arago, 35, of 6 Rose Street, Haverhill, was arrested at 4.29 p.m. Sunday at home and charged with assault with a dangerous weapon and threat to commit a crime. Two Haverhill residents face assault charges in court stemming from a police investigation Thursday evening. Katie Betts, 32, of 16 Auburn Street, Haverhill, was arrested at 7.25 p.m. Thursday at 63 Franklin Street. She was charged with two counts of assault and battery, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and witness intimidation. A resident, Robert Butcher, 58, of 63 Franklin Street, was taken into custody at 40 Howard Street on a charge of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. No further details were available by deadline. In other police news, two motorists faced drunk driving charges following arrests by Haverhill Police during traffic stops over the holiday weekend. Melissa Hodgdon, 41, of Peabody, was arrested at 12.23 a.m. Saturday at 39 South Prospect Street and charged with one count of driving under the influence of liquor. At 11.29 p.m. Thursday, police arrested Lisa Dion, 50, of 47 Brook Street, Haverhill, during a traffic stop on South Elm Street. She was charged with driving under the influence of liquor, reckless operation, and alcohol from an open container. Also, a Haverhill woman charged with shoplifting Sunday afternoon at Westgate Shopping Plaza, 400 Lowell Avenue, faces additional unrelated charges under an outstanding warrant. Kimberly Nichols, 32, of 355 Washington Street, Haverhill, was arrested at 2.52 p.m. Sunday at the plaza and charged with one count of shoplifting. Under a warrant, she was also charged with assault and battery and destruction of property. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail. From Feature Story News in New York, I'm Nick Harper. Bahrain and Sudan have severed diplomatic relations with Iran, siding with Saudi Arabia over a deepening sectarian rift in the region. It follows the Saudi execution of a prominent Shia cleric over the weekend. The United Arab Emirates has also recalled its ambassador to Tehran. Meanwhile, top UN officials have been expressing deep concern over the escalating row. Here's FSN's correspondent Li Ling Tan in New York on the UN's reaction. 
Speaking by phone to the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia and Iran, UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon condemned the attack on the Saudi embassy in Tehran and said Riyadh's decision to break ties with Iran was deeply worrying. Ban also expressed his disappointment over the execution of Shiite cleric Sheikh El Nima. In Geneva, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayed Rad El Hussein, deplored the mass execution in which 47 people were killed. The executions and the fallout have propelled relations between both longtime foes to their worst since the 1980s. UN officials are worried the crisis could spill over into the international stage and derail efforts to end conflicts in Syria and Yemen. The United States has also urged Saudi Arabia and Iran to cool tensions. Here's US State Department spokesman John Kirby. We continue to believe that diplomatic engagement and direct conversations are essential to work through differences. Increased friction runs counter to the interests of all those in the international community who support moderation, peace, and stability. We reiterate the need for leaders throughout the region to redouble efforts aimed at de-escalating regional tensions. The U.S. Justice Department is suing the Volkswagen Group, which installed devices designed to trick vehicle emissions tests. The civil lawsuit relates to nearly 600,000 vehicles under the VW, Porsche and Audi brands. FSN's Washington correspondent Daniel Wrenches reports. The complaint alleges that Volkswagen deliberately cheated the system by installing devices in a range of models designed to detect testing and then temporarily reduce levels of nitrogen oxides. The lawsuit also accuses the German firm of violating US environmental pollution laws during normal vehicle use to harmful levels for public health and which contributes to the build-up of greenhouse gases. The civil action does not preclude the possibility of criminal charges being sought in the future. Global stock markets took a tumble on the first full day of trading of 2016 as economic data out of China worried investors. Chinese authorities halted trading, sparking fears of more global market volatility. European and US markets closed significantly down, following similar sell-offs in Asia. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather! I'm WHAB meteorologist Rob St. Pierre with wave weather. Now, as we go through tonight, sky's going to be clearing up. Low temperatures will be dropping back to around 10 above zero, maybe even a couple of degrees colder than that in some locations. Mostly sunny on Tuesday, kind of breezy, especially at the coast, with a high just 25. It'll be clear Tuesday night, lows will be in the mid-teens, and those temperatures may climb a little bit after midnight. And we're set for a milder day Wednesday. Sunshine with a high of 40, right into mostly sunny on Thursday with a high in the low 40s. I'm meteorologist Rob St. here for your next wave weather in 30 minutes. This is Pacifica Radio for the Merrimack Valley, WHAV. Stay informed each day with local news, coupled with FSN's worldwide coverage. WHAV LP Haverhill, the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. Catch the wave, WHAV, Merrimack Valley. Open mic! From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome back to the Open Mic Show, a 50-year staple of democracy in the Merrimack Valley. Chris is going to adjust the camera. Uh, in the studio now is Reverend Frank Clarkson, uh, minister of the uh, Universalist Unitarian Church in Haverhill. Now, some of you who are from other cities or uh, know this, that everywhere else in the country it seems it's the Unitarian Universalist Church, but in Haverhill uh, the Universalist was the, the stronger uh, church at the merger, and in fact Haverhill was ahead of, ahead of the nation, uh, merging on 11 years before the nation did with those churches. So, Reverend Clarkson, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, oh, for this uh, discussion. Thanks for having me, Tim. I, I, when uh, we sent out, matter of fact, uh, Chris, when you have a moment, you can put uh, on the video uh, a photograph of the banner. Um, the, the church brought this to uh, the attention of the news media, it's been a couple weeks now, that uh, uh, the 
the Universalist Unitarian Church in Haverhill hung a uh, banner. There it is. Our faith calls us to affirm Black Lives Matter. And um, apparently, you worried that there could be a reaction, so you met with, with Haverhill police in advance. Is that right? Yes. The way our process worked was our board of trustees, which is nine members of the congregation who are elected every year by the congregation to, to lead the congregation and make choices and policy, started having conversations this fall about the uh, things that we've been witnessing around our country, particularly in the last year, the number of oftentimes young African-American men who were dying um, oftentimes at the hands of police. And we were troubled by this and, and wanted to make some statement and hopefully invite some wider community conversation about this. And so we decided to create this banner and hang it and we hung it about a month before Christmas and it was torn down um, I think about four days before Christmas. So it hung up for about a month before somebody forcibly removed it. Um, one thing I would like to say is that we never saw the uh, hanging of a banner as the end. We saw that as the beginning of hopefully a long conversation and some work around race in our community. But when our board was talking about this, I proposed to them that I go and have a conversation with the police department because we wanted to be very clear that we didn't see this as anti-police. We see the police as the front line of work for justice in our community and are incredibly grateful for the good work they do in the neighborhood where the church is and across our city. And so I wanted to go to them and let them know that though we had some concerns about violence in other parts of the country, um, we were not making any allegations ar around the Haverhill Police, and we had a very productive conversation with them, and they said, we support you in whatever it is we you do. Well, no, it was, it was good that you had the discussion um, with the police just to make sure that there are no misunderstandings. Exactly. And, um, uh, when uh, your story appeared, uh, you immediately received the support of the mayor of Haverhill, Mayor uh, Jim Fiorentini, who was sworn into a seventh uh, term this morning. Uh, he said, uh, and he, he's often consulting with police, that uh, they would investigate and, and prosecute if uh, someone came forward. Do you um, believe... And I suppose it's a speculation that with so many other churches having uh, similar vandalism that there is a concerted effort across the state or do you think it's just kind of a one-off in this case? It, it, like you said, it's hard to know or to speculate. I find it hard to imagine that there's a concerted effort. Um, it does seem apparent to me that this expression, Black Lives Matter, strikes a nerve with some white people. And I will tell you that I should be clear that when I'm here tonight, I'm really just speaking for myself. I represent the good people of the UU Church, but we are not completely of one mind in that congregation. There are some people who have expressed their concerns to me. They would like for it to say, Black Lives Matter too, or they would like for us to have done things quieter than hanging a banner. And so... Um, well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's always, uh, I suppose, a concern about any congregation and, and trying to reach a consensus. But the name of the group is, or the movement is Black Lives Matter, not Black Lives Matter too. Exactly. So you're respecting the name of the organization. Right. Well, when I saw some of the comments, and we'll take a break in about two minutes, but when I saw some of the comments on WHAV.net, no less, uh, it, it struck me that um, there were some strong feelings about this. Right. Uh, and there were some, like our listener who called just before you came on the air, who, who had a valid concern uh, that uh, they blocked uh, a group uh, at least using the name Black Lives Matter, and right. I did not have a chance to, to research to see if it was a sanctioned activity or not, uh, had blocked uh, Route uh, Interstate 93. And I think, as I mentioned, uh, presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, uh, who I think arguably would be most on the side of uh, the Black Lives M uh, Matter movement, uh, was well, unable to speak at a at a campaign event right. because of uh, of event. So I think those are legitimate issues to discuss about how any group carries on a movement. Sure. But some of the other comments uh, I saw, frankly, uh, were were startling. Um, 
I found people repeating things that I thought, well, let me go find out where that came from. Um, and when I started researching, uh, when people say, well, it's a hate group. And I thought, did some entity, national, international, make this designation? No, it was Bill O'Reilly on Fox News. I would say far from, far, far from an organization that could make that, uh, that um, claim. And much of what I read seems to be, much of these misconceptions do seem to go back to, frankly, right-wing talk shows. Right. But I guess my question for you is, has this been quietly boiling in the background? I mean, I thought we had, frankly, as a society, moved beyond um, saying, even if, even if individuals thought these kinds of things, that they didn't say them any longer. Is someone like a Donald Trump making it easier for people to make uh, unkind comments? And, and I'm obviously asking you to speculate. Sure. <laughs> I. I have to say I have been troubled over the last few months about the – and the last year about the increasingly divisive tone of rhetoric in our country. I, um, I think the – I understand that when people are afraid, we do not often respond well. I think the uh, recent terror attacks in Paris and then in San Bernardino provided a ripe opportunity for somebody like Mr. Trump to take advantage of people's fears. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I haven't had a chance to connect with him, but I sent a message to the imam at the Islamic Cultural Center in Haverhill because I was concerned about the anti-Muslim rhetoric. And I said something about this in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the idea that in the United States of America, we would be excluding people and being afraid of people, good American citizens, because of their religious affiliation, is very troubling to, I think, anybody who loves freedom and loves this country. So there is a, a wave of um, fear in our country right now that I think good people need to, to stand up and speak about. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with, with uh, the concerns that were raised about blocking I-93. If I'd been involved in that, I would not have been for that, and, and I'm not um, uh, a leader or even involved particularly other than saying our congregation supports the aims of this um, Black Lives Matter movement, which is a liberation movement. Um, but that doesn't mean when, sometimes when you support a movement, it doesn't mean you condone every action that's been done in its that's name. That's true. Just like when it, someone supports whomever they might vote for, the ballot box may not agree with 100 percent of the positions right. of that candidate. Can I speak to the Bill O'Reilly thing yes. for a minute? I, th I think what that was about, um, after there was um, – forgive me, I can't remember his name um, – on Long Island who died, who was smothered. Um, while being held down to the ground by yes, police. Yes. There, were pr pr there were protests in the city, and some of the people, I think, were rightfully angry about that black man who had died at the hands of police. And unfortunately, some of those protesters started saying, chanting slogans about killing police. I never heard anyone from the Black Lives Matter movement condone those, I assume, and hope they were disavowed. Um, violence is never solved by more violence. And so I think those are outliers, and I think um, people like Bill O'Reilly know how to take these extreme cases and then get other people afraid by them. I think he may have his own reasons for trying to undermine the movement, but... Um, it might just be ratings. Right. <laughs> that, that could be true, too. Uh, I, you know, a thought, historical thought, be, uh, before we, I want to play a comment, but historical thought is that, uh, unfortunately, during World War II, right here in the United States, <clears throat> there were some Americans who were driven uh, to fear to the point where Japanese Americans who had been here for, for many generations were put in camps concentration camps right here in the United States. This is has been universally condemned. Uh, I don't think anyone now would ever consider such a thing, but it tells us how fear can drive people to do things that they otherwise would never even consider doing. Right. 
All right. Uh, as we go to this uh, break for Community Spotlight, uh, there was a comment made. Um, Reverend, I, I think it's maybe his Reverend, um, yep. Peter Morales of the UUA Association, which is what, the, the kind of a parent uh, group. Our national organization, yeah. Based here, right here in Boston, is right, that right? right. Um, he uh, made a couple of comments. Uh, he sent these to churches as uh, as churches had had been vandalized. I think at the time he made this recording, December 6th, uh, there were 17. And I, I, I thought he made a couple of good points. Let's play one of them and then we'll go right to Community Spotlight. And uh, I had queued it up before, so it might take a second. events have forced us to face the reality of oppression in America once again and the reality that racism is stronger now and is more flagrant than it was just a few years ago. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. WHAV will soon be on FM radio, but only with your help. Help make waves and bring local news to FM by donating at WHAV.net. Just look for the photograph of Tom Bergeron, honorary chairperson. Catch the wave! The most trusted man in America, news anchor Walter Cronkite, once said, It is absolutely essential in a democracy to have competition in the media. A lot of competition. That sentiment is one of the driving forces behind WHAV's expanded local news effort. This is News Director Dana Esmail inviting you to listen to my hourly weekday newscast right here on WHAV. You'll also find the area's most comprehensive local news reporting at whav.net on your computer or smartphone. Remember, WHAV is the only Haverhill-based news source, and it's always free. And that's the way it is. Community Spotlight. Community Actions Family and Community Connection offers toddler playgroups each weekday morning. Family and Community Connection and Pentucket Area Early Intervention provide the playgroups for children 18 to 36 months old from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. at the First Presbyterian Church, 346 Broadway in Haverhill. A trained and experienced developmental specialist leads all groups. There is no charge. Registrations will cry though as space is limited. For more information, call 978-914-7893 or visit communityactioninc.org. Someone you know is on WHAV. To submit or read your own nonprofit announcements, click on the contact tab at whav.net or email news at whav.net. In the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, this is Mark LeMay. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome back to the Open Mic Show. Uh, this is where Chris starts getting real nervous in Master Control because I'm like two minutes away from my next break. Obviously, we're not going to do that. So we'll have weather will be a little bit delayed, and I'll try to get back on schedule. Uh, all right, in, in the studio now, if you're just joining us, Reverend Frank Clarkson of Haverhill's Universalist Unitarian Church. Uh, real quickly for background, uh, the church hung a banner uh, that has said essentially that it affirms that black lives matter. Uh, the banner uh, was up for less than a month, 
uh, was torn down uh, by vandals and stolen. Uh, other churches in the Commonwealth and, and probably elsewhere that have displayed uh, such banners have had a similar vandalism there. Uh, what seems to have happened is we have lots of comments. And I don't know if you, you heard me before you came on, but I have to say, we, 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 we heard and people wrote on, on WHAV's website things like, Black Lives Matter is an uh, official hate group. Um, we, we hear, uh, Reverend Clarkson, can you explain supporting an organization that publicly calls for killings of Cox? Black Lives Matter is worse than KKK. We heard all of these comments, and uh, there was one. There was one that was so different, I, I feel compelled uh, to read it again. Uh, a woman named Robin. Um, wrote, if I say raspberry ice cream is tasty, I'm not saying the other flavors are bad. There's no contradiction. Why so defensive? And I thought that was just, what a great comment. Uh, that was one that was just so different from the others. And uh, I, I applaud this person for having the courage to be, at the time, the only, only comment uh, that was supportive of the church. When you brought this to... Um, uh, Haverhill Police afterward, after uh, the theft occurred, um, did you have a sense that uh, the, the, the police understood the position and were supportive of your efforts? I mean, imagine that with a large enough force, there might be some who haven't, who didn't know of your original meeting with police. That could be true. Um, they were very cordial and professional, and a detective came by, uh, an officer came by and took a report, and then a detective called me and asked me some questions and they said they would do an investigation. Um, like I said earlier, I and we in the church really appreciate everything that the members of the Haverhill Police do to keep our city safe and to be a force for justice in our community. And we've never seen hanging a ba banner affirming the what we see as the good work of this Black Lives Matter liberation group um, to be anti-police. and. My hope would be that law enforcement officials and district's attorney and anybody involved in uh, the criminal justice system would be speaking out when we have young black men who are dying on the streets. Like, I don't know if you read the reports that were out again recently about Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy who was killed. Um, because he was playing with a toy gun. With a toy gun, yes, the, I did. The video of that, um, I, I, just, I guess I have to say, when people are so outraged by a simple banner that asserts Black Lives Matter and says, why do you need to be saying this? Go watch the video of Tamir Rice and try to reconcile that with the fact that those police officers were not indicted that that cruiser pulls up and in less than a second a gun is coming out of that car and shooting this boy and then he's left to lie there dying and they do not even comfort him or do anything to assist him for something like four minutes and i think that is a symbol of the race problem we have in our country i'd like to think that maybe maybe in new england um that this is such a foreign concept yeah. that uh that that is why some some people have not completely embraced embraced what the UU Church is trying to do because like well no no one would do that the the officer must have felt threatened, uh, but that's a New England mentality. Mm -hmm. Now I, I couldn't help but notice, and I'm not sure that I knew this before I looked up your your biography, but you um, you are you're a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now um, I I gave a talk once um, at Research Triangle Park. And uh, this is when Jesse Helms was yep. uh, still yep. there. And um, I was at the airport, and um, the friendliest person um, I don't picked up on that I, that I had a New England accent, I'm not sure, and he said, oh, I just want you to know that, that some of us really do love Ted Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, but Chapel Hill is a little different. It's like you're Cambridge. They often call it the Republic of Chapel Hill. When, uh, <laughs> I, I, so I grew up, I'm native North Carolinian, and I was actually just down there last week visiting my mom who lives in Charlotte, which is where I grew up. But uh, um, 
when I was in school at Chapel Hill and Jesse Helms was one of our uh, U.S. senators, he at one point in time was infamous for saying, because they were the state was talking about putting down money to have a state zoo, and he said, um, there's no reason to do that. If you just put a fence around Chapel Hill, that'll be the state zoo. Oh, and geez. so, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was not... A more background on the comment. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, but you are from the South, so right. you're in an ideal position, perhaps, to uh, look at my hypothesis. Is, is it possible that New Englanders just... This is such a foreign concept that they can't imagine that uh, the blacks uh, are are targeted in the South and historically have been? Or would you argue that, no, you're overdoing the, the, the South? I, I think it's both. Um, I, I think because um, in the South there's more proximity between blacks and whites, um, the South has both had more problems and many of those have been publicized. But I think the South has also managed to do more of its work around race. When I was in high school, I went to a, a high school on the other side of town that was in a black middle class neighborhood and it was 50% black and 50% white. And we had some rough spots, but not that many. And at some point in time, that was around the same time that um, students in Southie were being bussed. And there was a lot of violence. I was just going to ask you about that because I, you, as, as soon as I said it, I said, you know, actually we've had some problems. Right. <laughs> well, something that happened that, that people in Charlotte actually took some pride in is we had an exchange program from some of our with some of our students and some of the students from Southie because they came to our school in North Carolina to see how blacks and whites could get along. It's a little bit of reverse of the stereotype. Very interesting. Yeah. That's very, um, very interesting. That was in about 1976. Um, so I think the reason that that people are threatened by this assertion of Black Lives Matter goes to um, a long-standing race problem we have in our country. I don't think we've ever come to terms with the fact that black people were brought here to this country in chains. Families were torn apart. People were sold like cattle. And that happened for hundreds of years here. And it wasn't just the South that benefited from that. New England benefited from that as well. Um, and, you know, in South Africa, where they had the terrible apartheid system, the way South Africa came into a new day was by this system called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I have to say, I, um, I've often thought the Truth and Reconciliation Commission approach could be used here for lots yep. of things. Uh, we'll save that for a, yeah. a political discussion. Right, but we've never done that. We in this country, and so I feel like um, many of us who are white walk around aware on some level that we have had our lives made better by no nothing we did to earn that. Um, what commonly gets talked about is white privilege. Um, and that black people, our relationships as whites with black people are very complicated, I think, because of slavery. And it's very hard to talk about in our culture. And I think this is something we've got to figure out because I think that is part of what's at the root of this fear of young black men that is causing young black men to get killed. You know, white families do not sit down with their young white sons and say, this is how you need to act so you won't get shot out on the streets. And that's a conversation many, many black families have with their children. And that's just wrong. And we need to change our culture so that doesn't happen. No, and then and I would just, that I guess would help explain some of the motivations for the congregation supporting yeah. this concept. All right, let's take a brief break for weather. Uh, we're going to hear local weather. We'll be back in just a moment with Reverend Frank Clarkson from the Universalist Unitarian Church in Haverhill. Open mic. Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. 
It's 738. This is listener-supported community radio, WHAV. WHAV is the Merrimack Valley's Pacifica affiliate. Catch the wave! Suspense, a weekly anthology of notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented every Monday night to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Listen to the new suspense with a company of Hollywood actors and surprising guest stars, Monday nights at 10, with encore performances at 1 a.m., right here on WHAV. Remember... Only local radio can bring you this feature opportunity, but only WHAV does. Wave weather! I'm WHAV meteorologist Rob Saint here with Wave Weather. As we go through tonight, sky is going to be clearing out. Low temperatures will be dropping back to around 10 above zero, maybe even a couple of degrees colder than that in some locations. Mostly sunny on Tuesday, kind of breezy, especially at the coast, with a high just 25. It'll be clear Tuesday night, lows will be in the mid-teens, and those temperatures may climb a little bit after midnight. And we're set for a milder day Wednesday. Sunshine with a high of 40, correcting to mostly sunny on Thursday with a high in the low 40. Some meteorologist Rob St. Pierre for your next way weather in 30 minutes. W-H-A-V, open mic! From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. is being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies, choose the Merrimack Valley. Okay, continuing our discussion um, with Reverend Frank Clarkson. Um, we're aware of the banner, uh, and, and it, uh, I think your press release says it will be replaced. Has it been replaced yet? We've ordered it. We haven't <laughs> received it yet. We'll, uh, we'll be hanging another one soon. Probably right. in a location a little less accessible to vandals. I see. Would that mean higher, or you haven't decided where? I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking higher. All right. So, now um, we were discussing during the break um, that okay, the banner and maybe the comments uh, that have appeared are kind of helping to start the dialogue. Is there any possibility there'll be something more formal? I would hope that this kind of conversation would ripple out and start some wider conversations in our community. I would be very pleased if if other civic leaders, police representatives, um, people from the business community or from other congregations, um, religious groups want to get together, we'd be very happy to host a forum um, because though I appreciate any forum for people communicating I think it is easier in these anonymous forums for people to, as I said in my sermon a couple days ago, stand back and throw stones from a distance. Um, something that I just want to reiterate in, in the comment that I made at WHAV online was that I would be very pleased to sit down with anybody who has concerns about us taking the stand and have a conversation because I think um, there's always a story behind a person. I said, I'm, I'll even buy the coffee. So right. reach out to me. If you would like to have a conversation, you can reach me at frank at uuhaverill.org. That's my email. Um, but I think the way towards a and better you're, community. You're at the church every Sunday at 1030. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you're welcome to join us. We'd love to have you. It's a, it's a wonderful congregation. I'm really pleased to be serving there. Um, and you know, it seems to me, um, and this is something that's widely shared in the church, is that religion is not meant was never meant to be boxed up within the four walls of a building. And if you're not doing things to make the world a better place, then why do you exist? That's why we why we're here. So um, I uh, so I would welcome interaction with people. To, that's, uh, that's a good point. So let's make sure we get the email address out there. Frank 
at uuhaverill.org. Yes. And then, of course, you'd welcome him at the church, and he's even offered to buy coffee. So um, those of us who maybe have a little too much of it every day <laughs> will take you up on it. Uh, maybe a good place to wrap up is where we started, and that is – there's another comment on uh, the website after this story. Um, the person wrote, but I am guessing the White Lives Matter banner is still there. Oh, I guess if there isn't one, then they don't matter. And your point is that – this isn't a comparison. White lives matter, all lives matter, but in particular, we, we need to spend some time uh, focusing on right. black lives right. matter. One thing that I would urge anybody who finds the words black lives matter to be annoying or makes you angry, just go to blacklivesmatter.com and check out that website. The, the founders of that movement are three black women who started it after um, the killings. Um, oh, I forget his name. George Zimmerman That's right. killed um, George, uh, Martin? Uh, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin. And, and this is, was nothing new. I think if you talk to black people, violence against blacks has been more um, – has been, it's been out of proportion to the number percentage of the population for a long time in our country. And so, of course, white lives matter. Of course, everybody's lives matter. The trouble is, in our society, it oftentimes seems like black lives don't matter. It is a provocative statement. It's intentionally pro provocative because black men, especially young black men, are dying at a disproportionate rate in our country and are being locked away at a disproportionate rate in our country. And so the only way we're going to change this is by starting to talk about it and then changing our policies so we really do become a more just society. Here's another comment that you might uh, – that will echo what you've just said and you, maybe you like the sentiment. Um, Patricia writes, I don't need anyone to – quote, explain, end quote, the Black Lives Matter movement to me. In view of the ever-escalating violence against people of color in this increasingly hate-based, hate-filled, beloved country of ours, am very glad to hear that Reverend Clarkson and Haverhill's UU community have found support among Haverhill City Government and Police Department in their affiliation with the Black Lives Matter movement. I really appreciate that, and it's also a good reminder, and maybe if we're wrapping up a good place to end. Um, I love the quote that's attributed to um, Anne Frank, you know, who was killed by the Nazis hiding in Amsterdam. And in her diary she wrote, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. And that's certainly the core of my faith, is that people are good at heart and in the end, love does prevail. And I think the, the challenge and the invitation of these times that we live in is for those of us who do believe that there is injustice in the world. We need to stand up and be counted. We need to join hands with everybody who wants to do their part to make ours a better world. It was Martin Luther King, who we, um, whose birthday we'll be celebrating in a couple weeks, if you've never read his letter from Birmingham jail, I would recommend everybody go read it. It's, a, it's an amazing piece of writing, but in it he said that we will have to repeat, repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. And my belief is that our country is full of good people who are oftentimes leading very busy lives and working hard to just take care of things from day to day, but sometimes you have to stand up and be counted and say, this isn't right. We need to be better than this. Good point. And actually, that uh, someday maybe we'll have another discussion about incarceration rates mm -hmm. and the uh, for-profit uh, prison companies, but that'll be for another day. But they lead into some of, these, some of these topics. Thank Reverend you. Clarkson, thank you very much for, for joining us. Please feel free to let us know if there are any public forums or events or, or discussions or at any time you'd like to return to the program. 
Thank you, Tim. I really, really appreciate the invitation. It's been an honor to be with you, and I appreciate the the good nature of your listeners and hope that anybody who wants to continue this conversation with me as an individual that they'll reach out to me because I would welcome that. And again, that email address, uh, I've forgotten it, uh, I Frank, it. <laughs> Frank at uuhaverill.org. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank we're you. going to, uh, we're almost back on schedule. We're going to go take a break. This hour we're going to hear a movie review. And then we'll be back to take your calls and comments on the open mic. Open mic! Tim Coco and the open mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. Last year, WHAV helped local nonprofits by airing nearly 10,000 community spotlight messages. WHAV is the only Haverhill based news source, and it's always free. Catch the wave! Melinda's Garden Moments help gardeners create and maintain a healthy, beautiful garden with ease, inside or out, and all year long. This is Melinda Myers, inviting you to tune in every weekday morning right here on WHAV. You'll learn creative ways to grow your own vegetables and herbs while beautifying your landscape. Eco-friendly lawn care, flower garden design basics, unique container gardens, attracting birds and butterflies to the landscape, and much more. Again, please join me weekday mornings for Melinda's Garden Moment for a very environmentally friendly approach to gardening. Remember, only local radio can bring you this feature opportunity, but only WHAV does. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, two for the price of one. Tom Hardy might be one of the better actors working today, but occasionally he gets involved with intriguing-sounding projects like early 2015's Child 54 that just don't work. His latest, Legend, is no such bust, but he does personally embody most of its redeeming qualities. The movie is the rise and fall story of the Cray twins, Reggie and Ronnie, who ruled London's criminal underground in the 50s and 60s. Ronnie was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic with a pathological bent towards ultraviolence. Reggie was more the smooth criminal who didn't have a problem with violence as long as it served a purpose. Hardy plays both Ronnie and Reggie, a feat previously accomplished by the likes of Betty Davis and Michael J. Fox, and he succeeds in capturing both the disturbed intensity of Ronnie and the calculating sociopathy of Reggie. In one memorable scene, Ronnie discloses his homosexuality to a visiting American mobster. The revulsion on the mobster's face suddenly turns to a toast to Ronnie's courage as Hardy rivets a palpable threat. Director Brian Helgeland of LA Confidential fame does a decent job with bringing the underside of London life in the swinging 60s to the screen and spares us a little with the action sequences. Ultimately, though, he doesn't bring much new to the table, past enlightening an American audience not as familiar with the craze as the British. Even noting that the treatment here could be called generic cinema criminal we get a fair if predictable look at their personal lives particularly reggie's relationship with his wife francis who also narrates their corrupt associations with businessmen and politicians get covered but we don't get much of a feel for the dynamics of these relationships legend isn't legendary but hardy's work here is this has been take two movie review i'm mike friend catch up with us at take two movie review.com and feed us back on our page on youtube W-H-A-V Open Mic From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom W-H-A-V presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net Welcome back to the Open Mic Show. I'm Tim Coco, your host. In Master Control is 
don't know if he still wants me to say this. Chris, the man with five radio jobs, all of them unpaid. All right. And uh, and Lori, you know, I don't know how she feels about it. Maybe after the news at 8, maybe she wants to come on because uh, she's already shaking her head. She's going to quit. No, okay. Uh, but <laughs> so, uh, Lori will be helping out at the front desk, so thank you very much. Uh, this hour of Open Mic being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. All right. Uh, we have about seven minutes minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, I'm sure some of you had some feelings, strong uh, or otherwise, about the topic. I want to encourage you now to call me, 978-374-1900. If you don't want to talk about uh, the topic uh, that we just had, uh, open lines for the rest of the program. Also, be sure uh, to take advantage of the opportunity, like Brian did at the start of the show, to call and wish someone a happy birthday or a couple a happy anniversary, uh, an individual or a couple celebrating in February. Um, sometimes we even kind of stretch things. You know, maybe we'll work in Valentine's Day at a February event, something, uh, open it up to more people, more opportunities to win. Uh, but uh, all you have to do is name the person, uh, just first name. Chris will take the first and last when you first call in. Uh, the name will be added to the hat, and on the last Monday of this month, we'll draw the winner for the LBD's Second Generation Italian Bakery Cake Contest. It's a seven inch cake, choice of vanilla or chocolate. Nothing could be easier to win this. Uh, just, just go on the air, say happy birthday. Danny and uh, we will put it in and then at the end of the month if Danny's name is drawn for example we'll send you a letter uh, or Danny a letter and it simply gives the phone number and instructions for ordering a freshly baked cake choosing your flavors and then uh, you bring the letter with you to pick up the cake free of charge uh, we're very very thankful to LBD second generation Italian bakery 140 South Main Street in Bradford for providing these free gifts. All right. Um, see, I know, a couple months it'll be before we open Woody your birthplace, so we won't be giving away tickets there yet. There may be other, other gifts and prizes coming as we go. So uh, give me a call. Any topic of the day, 978-374-1900. This morning, uh, city leaders were inaugurated in the city of Haverhill. Methuen did it yesterday. So Mayor Fiorentini, unopposed during the election, uh, not even a write-in candidate, and he uh, took the oath of office for his seventh term today. City Council President John Mitchison will will resume uh, will stay in that position as Council President. He had quite a few comments to make today about economic development. You'll hear more about that on the news tomorrow. And new City Council Vice President Melinda Barrett, uh, Melinda Barrett, who uh, owns Mel uh, Melinda Barrett Specialty Foods downtown Merrimack Street, um, moved up in the election. Uh, she her first run, she came, uh, you know, on the, the top half of the council vote wise, moved up even further. Council Vice President now. Now, new councilors, uh, Andy Vargas and Joseph Bevilacqua, were seated. Joseph Bevilacqua is still technically a school committee member, and he said he plans to attend the next school committee meeting, but he will not um, remain on the board. By law, he was allowed to remain on the council and the school committee as long as he didn't take two salaries. Uh, we'll discuss salaries in a second. So... It's, um, uh, he's going to step down. Now, here's, here's a speculation I talked about at the beginning of the program um, that, that may make some sense. Uh, Joe Bevilacqua had said, and I always believed he would keep his word, he said he would take one position or the other if elected to city council, and he's doing just that. So then you might ask, well, why, why did he say after the election maybe... Uh, maybe his position is going to change because there were some people who said they didn't vote for him for city council because they wanted him to stay on the school committee. I find that 
hypothesis a little hard to swallow. Um, I wonder what might make more sense is that Joe believes uh, in tradition, and the tradition says a vacancy filled on either the city council or the school committee is filled by the next vote-getter in line. And in this case, um, although it's subject to a vote, uh, Sean Tui, who lost the election uh, for school committee, could come in and fill the unexpired term of Joe Bevilacqua. My theory is that Joe really wanted to ensure that tradition was followed, and by giving up too soon, uh, we'd have almost a mini-election in the city over the last month or so. With We had a number of candidates uh, saying, well, if no one else wants it, I'll be on the school committee. We had, I think, a former educator. We had an outgoing school committee member, um, Susan Danahy, saying, well, if necessary, she could step up. Uh, very nice to get the offer. Um, we hadn't actually heard from Sean Tui, but he obviously ran for election, uh, came very close. It was just a, a very competitive race with former city councilor Sven and Marion and um, a pretty high vote getter Gail Sullivan running. Uh, it's just one of those things. So I, I think, Joe, it's my theory, nothing to back it up really, just except a gut feeling that Joe just wanted to help preserve the idea that the next highest vote getter should take the seat. That next highest vote getter would remain on the school committee in the form of Sean Tui. You ever thought of that? 978-374-1900. about to go to news, so hold that maybe until about 5 after. 978-374-1900. Talked also about salaries, city council salaries. Well, Haverhill City Council and the Haverhill School Committee both gave back their salaries in December, a portion of them, not all of it. Um, it turns out that both had voted to increase their salaries or expense accounts. Um, I don't actually like to make the distinction because, frankly, these aren't expense accounts where you show up with your receipts and say, well, I went to the baseball game and I gave out ice cream at the fair. Uh, no, the, the councils receive the money. They don't have to show any receipts. As such, they're actually, they actually receive a 1099 from the city. Uh, that is taxable income. So whether we call it salaries or expense accounts, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. The counselors uh, and the school committee members get the money. Um, well, there's a new commission uh, that's going to decide uh, or at least recommend what those amounts should be. Mayor Fiorentini appointed former Haverhill Mayor John Guerin, my class president, class of 1979 at Haverhill High School, uh, is going to chair that commission, and there will be other members. But we're going to go to news now. Uh, that's a subject you can call us about after that. Uh, we'll be back with the Open Mic Show after news and weather. Open Mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. It's 8.02. WHAV LP Haverhill. WHAV is a nonprofit community service of Public Media of New England, Incorporated. Here's what's happening in local news. Breaking news this evening here on WHAV, newly sworn Haverhill City Councilor Joseph J. Bevilacqua has decided to, quote, keep my word and my commitment, end quote, by choosing to step down from his seat on the Haverhill School Committee. In a letter filed late this afternoon to City Clerk Linda L. Codalis, Bevilacqua said he had anticipated he would step down if elected to the council. However, quote, a number of people encouraged him to remain on the school committee while serving on the council. While permissible under law, he could only accept one salary from either panel. Quote, I have given this serious consideration in recognition of my role, contribution, and participation as a member of the school committee and the challenges before Haverhill that remain to continue to provide the best education possible for our school children, Bevilac was said. Quote, however, I also recognize the most important thing an elected official has is his word, and I gave mine to the residents of Haverhill that I would step down if elected to the council. End quote. 
Bevilacqua's resignation from the school committee will be effective Friday, January 15, one day after the committee's scheduled first meeting of the new year. As WHAV reported last November, tradition suggests now former committee man Sean P. Tui, who finished in fourth place and did not win re-election, would be selected to complete the unexpired term. However, another former committee member, Susan Danahy, who did not run for another four-year term, said she would be interested in a two-year appointment to see the completion of the Hunking School project, quote, to the end. She remains a voting member on the Hunking School Building Committee. More details can be found at whav.net. A 64-year-old Haverhill man is under arrest tonight after allegedly pointing a handgun at a woman following an apparent incident of road rage on Interstate 495 this morning. Dennis Babar, 64, was arrested at his two Perkins Court home after a police investigation, said Captain Robert P. Pistone, police spokesman. The incident began just before 11 a.m. on 495. Babar is said to have followed the unidentified woman off the highway down Primrose Street and to her home. Witnesses were able to capture the license plate number, and an investigation was undertaken by patrolman Kevin Lynch. Quote, it was excellent police work by Officer Lynch, Pistone said. Babar was arrested at 2.45 p.m. and charged with assault with a dangerous weapon, threatening to commit a crime, and improper storage of firearms. He is expected to be arraigned Tuesday in Haverhill District Court. Former Haverhill Mayor John J. Guerin Jr. will lead a commission studying appropriate salaries for elected officials. Besides Guerin, Mayor James J. Fiorentini named a former city official and two business leaders as voting members of the new commission. Fiorentini agreed to name the body after both city council and school committee members were forced to rescind pay raises they voted themselves last year. Guerin, 26 Leroy Avenue, Haverhill, will be joined by former city personnel director Mary Carrington, 61 Upland Avenue, and Jeffrey Linehan, president, Diversified Business Systems, 144 Hilldale Avenue, and Stacey L. Brazisi, president, Greater Haverhill Chamber of Commerce, 80 Merrimack Street. Linehan resides in Boxford, and Brazisi resides in Windham, New Hampshire. Ferentini also appointed non-voting members, City Solicitor William D. Cox, Jr., 8 Richmond Street, and current City Personnel Director Denise McClanahan of Woburn. Members' terms expired June 30th. In mid-December, councillors voted unanimously to revoke the $2,400 increase in each councillor's expense account amid concerns about its legality. Following the vote, they approved by consensus, sending the mayor a letter directing him to establish a commission to, quote, study local elected officials' salaries and expenses for mayor, city council, and school committee, including a comparative analysis of local elected officials in other cities of comparable size, population, and form of government, end quote. The request came from Councillor Thomas J. Sullivan. Earlier, Haverhill School Committee members also voted to revoke its expense account increases without discussion. Two Greater Lawrence residents face unlicensed driving among other motor vehicle charges from Haverhill Police stemming from separate arrests over the weekend. Daphne Nevers, 25, of Methuen, was arrested at 9.35 p.m. Sunday at 79 River Street and charged with unlicensed driving and a motor vehicle lights violation. William Estevez, 42, of Lawrence, was arrested at 10.26 p.m. Friday on South Main Street, Bradford Section. He was charged with driving with a suspended license. Remember, WHAV is the only Haver-based news source, and it's always free. In the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom, this is Dana Esmail. From Feature Story News in New York, I'm Nick Harper. Bahrain and Sudan have severed diplomatic relations with Iran, siding with Saudi Arabia over a deepening sectarian rift in the region. It follows the Saudi execution of a prominent Shia cleric over the weekend. The United Arab Emirates has also recalled its ambassador to Tehran. Meanwhile, top UN officials have been expressing deep concern over the escalating row. Here's FSN's correspondent Li Ling Tan in New York on the UN's reaction. Speaking by phone to the foreign ministers of Saudi Arabia and Iran, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned the attack on the Saudi embassy in Tehran and said Riyadh's decision to break ties with Iran was deeply worrying. Ban also expressed his disappointment over the execution of Shiite cleric Sheikh El Nima. In Geneva, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayed Rad El Hussein, deplored the mass execution in which 47 people were killed. The executions and the fallout 
out have propelled relations between both longtime foes to their worst since the 1980s. UN officials are worried the crisis could spill over into the international stage and derail efforts to end conflicts in Syria and Yemen. The United States has also urged Saudi Arabia and Iran to cool tensions. Here's U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby. We continue to believe that diplomatic engagement and direct conversations are essential to work through differences. Increased friction runs counter to the interests of all those in the international community who support moderation, peace, and stability. We reiterate the need for leaders throughout the region to redouble efforts aimed at de-escalating regional tensions. The U.S. Justice Department is suing the Volkswagen Group, which installed devices designed to trick vehicle emissions tests. The civil lawsuit relates to nearly 600,000 vehicles under the VW, Porsche and Audi brands. FSN's Washington correspondent Daniel Wrenches reports. The complaint alleges that Volkswagen deliberately cheated the system by installing devices in a range of models designed to detect testing and then temporarily reduce levels of nitrogen oxides. The lawsuit also accuses the German firm of violating U.S. environmental pollution laws during normal vehicle use to harmful levels for public health and which contributes to the build-up of greenhouse gases. The civil action does not preclude the possibility of criminal charges being sought in the future. Global stock markets took a tumble on the first full day of trading of 2016 as economic data out of China worried investors. Chinese authorities halted trading, sparking fears of more global market volatility. European and US markets closed significantly down, following similar sell-offs in Asia. From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Wave weather! I'm WHAB meteorologist Rob St. Pierre with wave weather. As we go through tonight, sky is going to be clearing up. Low temperatures will be dropping back to around 10 above zero, maybe even a couple of degrees cold in that in some locations. Mostly sunny on Tuesday, kind of breezy, especially at the coast, with a high just 25. It'll be clear Tuesday night, lows will be in the mid-teens, and those temperatures may climb a little bit after midnight. And we're set for a milder day Wednesday. Sunshine with a high of 40, brightening a mostly sunny on Thursday with a high in the low 40s. I'm meteorologist Rob St. Pierre for your next way weather in 30 minutes. Are you listening to WHAV on cable television? If so, join WHAV in thanking the board, staff, and members of your local public access channel. This is Pacifica Radio for the Merrimack Valley. WHAV LP Haverhill. Listener supported community radio. Catch the wave, WHAV. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. This hour of the Open Mic Show being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose the Merrimack Valley. Okay, thanks to Chris Porter in Master Control producing the program tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Open lines, 978-374-1900. 978-374-1900 to go on the Open Mic Show. Now, there are a couple of reasons why you might want to do that. One, if you know someone having a birthday in February or a couple having an anniversary in February, Call right now and enter their name to win a free 7-inch cake from LBD Second Generation Italian Bakery, 140 South Main Street in Bradford. Now, um, you don't have to wait to win a cake to go there. and open every morning at 6 a.m., which just amazes me in the middle of the night as far as I'm concerned, uh, 6 a.m., I think Chris must get up around that time, right? Oh, yeah, well, so much for that. Uh, I, I just, I, I'll do, I'll, ha- I'll get up that early if I have to, but it's not my favorite thing. But in any, any event, uh, LBD Second Generation Italian Bakery has cakes, cookies, pastries, breads, you name it. And they're open every day at 6, so if you want to grab something on the way to work,
work or before catching the train uh, right there in uh, near Central Square. So it works out pretty well. I think it actually is Central Square. <clears throat> If you'd like to comment on uh, the matter that came up in the last hour, uh, Reverend Frank Clarkson, minister of the Universalist Unitarian Church in Canosa Street in Haverhill, uh, uh, told us about the uh, banner the church held uh, put up. It was uh, taken down by vandals. I will say that of all the comments, uh, I think most people did agree that no matter what, uh, you don't go tearing down someone else's property that there's a, a better way to have a discussion. And I do appreciate all, all of the comments, even if I don't agree with all of them. I do appreciate that the people took the time to write uh, in the comments sections underneath each story at whav.net. If you have not checked this out, uh, whav.net is not just the way to get to WHAV sound. Uh, you can read stories there, see photographs. Uh, in fact, uh, we got new statistics, I think 4.5 million people, uh, new and visitors, repeats alike, uh, came to whav.net. It is Haverhill's only base, the only Haverhill based news source, and it's always free, no paywalls. Um, you're not uh, charged anything. We do ask for your membership. WHAV is a now a nonprofit organization, and uh, there are several ways to contribute. You can become a member, various categories, starting at $10 for students and senior citizens, $25 and up for all others, and um, if you'd like to make an extra contribution uh, to the new transmitter necessary to put WHAV on the FM band at 97.9, anywhere you see Tom Bergeron's photo at WHAV, just click and you'll be taken to a GoFundMe campaign called Make Waves. That's a nice play on words. Make radio waves, uh, make trouble waves, uh, make waves. Uh, bring local news to FM. Congratulations to the members of the City Council and the School Committee, not to mention the Mayor, took office today. Mayor, seventh term. I mean, he had already broken the record, I think around the fifth, uh, but uh, serving uh, at that time the same length of time as the former previously longer serving Mayor Albert Glynn after World War II. Uh, but now the mayor is well ahead of that record, uh, serving uh, now beginning seven terms. City councilors have uh, been, voters largely returned most uh, people last um, uh, last October, uh, there was going to be a vacancy anyway with City Councilor Scatamaccia choosing not to seek re-election. And um, so that opened up one seat. That brought us um, uh, Andy Vargas, who had campaigned very uh, diligently. Um, and I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I think he got engaged over the, over the weekend. Uh, I don't know if I saw an old post or what, but if, if I'm remembering that correctly, congratulations, Councilor Vargas. And uh, Bill Ryan, um, who had been in almost every elected job that you can have in Haverhill, state representative, mayor, school committee member, city council, uh, he lost his bid for re-election. But I wouldn't count out Bill Ryan. He's, uh, he's always been involved, and I'm sure he always will be, uh, in one form or another. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Mayor Fiorentini hasn't already picked out a board uh, for Bill Ryan to, to sit on. So that's uh, that's something. But Joe Bevilacqua took uh, came in and filled that other vacancy, uh, and um, also is a member of the school committee, which he has been for many years. Uh, he announced today at WHAV that he will be uh, leaving the school committee. Uh, the seat presumably, this is an opinion show, presumably will go to Sean Tui. Uh, there are other uh, others who have expressed interest in it, but I think Joe Bevilacqua was hoping tradition would prevail and the next highest vote-getter, in this case, Sean Tui, would, would take the seat. All right. Uh, I know you have your fingers on the, on the dials, and you're just afraid you're going to interrupt me. So I'll tell you what. I'm going to take a break for Community Spotlight, and you can start dialing 978-374-1900. Open lines. Open mic! Tim Coco and the Open Mic will be right back. Get in on the action. 
Call 978-374-1900 or email tcoco at whav.net. If you are enjoying this program, please consider making a donation right now. Your donations to not-for-profit WHAV help keep these vital community services on the air. Donate online at www.whav.net. Tom Bergeron wants your help. He's the honorary chairperson of WHAV's Make Waves campaign to bring local news to FM radio. The sooner you contribute at WHAV.net, the sooner WHAV signs on at 97.9 FM. Just look for Tom's picture. Catch the wave! The most trusted man in America, news anchor Walter Cronkite, once said, It is absolutely essential in a democracy to have competition in the media. A lot of competition. That sentiment is one of the driving forces behind WHAV's expanded local news effort. This is News Director Dana Esmail inviting you to listen to my hourly weekday newscast right here on WHAV. You'll also find the area's most comprehensive local news reporting at whav.net on your computer or smartphone. Remember, WHAV is the only Havel-based news source, and it's always free. And that's the way it is. Community Spotlight! Community Action's Family and Community Connection offers toddler playgroups each weekday morning. Family and Community Connection and Pentucket Area Early Intervention provide the playgroups for children 18 to 36 months old from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. at the First Presbyterian Church, 346 Broadway in Haverhill. A trained and experienced developmental specialist leads all groups. There is no charge. Registration is required, though, as space is limited. For more information, call 978-914-7893 or visit communityactioninc.org. Someone you know is on WHAV. To submit or read your own nonprofit announcements, click on the contact tab at whav.net or email news at whav.net. In the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, this is Mark LeMay. From the Edwin B. Johnson Newsroom, WHAV presents the Open Mic Show with Tim Coco. Make your voice heard. Call 978-374-1900. That's 978-374-1900. Or email tcoco at whav.net. And welcome back to the Open Mic Show. This hour of the Open Mic being brought to you by the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council. Smart companies choose Valley. All right, I'm looking at the program for this morning's inauguration ceremony, National Anthem by the Haverhill High School Chorus, a Pledge of Allegiance by WHAV listener Gerard Boucher, Vice Commander of the DAV. Oh, that's great. Um, processional with Haverhill Police Honor Guard, Haverhill High School Band, Invocation Father John Delaney. I'm doing this in kind of reverse order. You've heard about all the people who won election um, and who took oaths of office, but we had ushers, uh, Killian uh, Barry, Joseph LeBlanc, City Messengers, John and Paul Smarts. You know, I don't know, um, are they brothers? Father, son, I'm not sure. John Smarts. Anyone have a comment? 978-374-1900. Sergeant at Arms, Ann Savinelli. And, of course, U.S. Senator Edward J. Markey gave the uh, uh, oath of office to the mayor. Uh, traditions uh, are not really solid there. And um, But we'll, um, why don't we go to the phones and see what our listeners have to say. You are on the Open Mic Show. Uh, good evening, good evening, Tim. How are you? Happy New Year, Jerry. Gokushis Neues Jahr. Ah, you're going to swear at me New now. Happy New Year in German. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All um, right. That exact uh, situation happened in Methuen, you know. With the banner? Uh, with the, uh, with the, what do you call it, with the uh, uh, school committee resigned. School oh, committee oh, member yes. Resigned. And it, I, I, it must be in Methuen's charter that the the next vote getter could that be a general law? No. No, actually, I, in Haverhill, it's actually up to 
the city council and the school committee, but tradition has held in Haverhill. Now, maybe in other places it's in the ordinances or bylaws. It is in Methuenity Ordinance. And the next, uh, uh, the next uh, person, uh, next highest vote getter was, uh, you know, was, uh, was, a, was a winner, if you want to call it a winning situation. Yeah, the one exception in Haverhill that I can think of in recent memory is City Councilor Betsy Conti died in office, and it was so close to the end of her term, um, they asked her husband to serve out the remainder of her term. That's very unusual, uh, but th- that doesn't happen much. No, it, it, it doesn't really. It's a good thing. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. If, if Clinton had resigned, maybe we'd have Hillary there, right? <laughs> oh well, it doesn't work that way now, does it? Right? <laughs> uh, there was a very Some, interesting, someone uh, might think we need Oliver Cromwell, but only <laughs> you will know that reference. <laughs> uh, I, uh, there was a very interesting um, public participated tonight, and uh, I, I didn't exactly get what the gist was. Apparently, a, a federal state law, a federal law was passed, and this particular person gave it. She was very, uh, a very learned person. You could tell, very articulate, old, really, probably in seventies uh, at least, maybe older. I don't know. But the participant got up there, and uh, and uh, the the thing that I, the final words that she um, uh, said were uh, that uh, she would like the council to be on record or. Uh, write a letter uh, to our congressman to let them know exactly uh, you know what the uh, what the writers uh, you know want uh, what the uh, citizens want and I think it was a simple thing I, I would have liked well, what to do you mean a copy kind of, of a the paper that was policy by referendum or I'm sorry what is the what was the, she advocating uh, 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 against the federal law that was just recently pa- passed which Gave more, really more power to uh, power to the, uh, Congress, really, and oh, okay. she wanted to object it, to it. And there are reasons where um, you cannot always uh, portray uh, uh, the uh, the thoughts of the um, <laughs> people, like the, the citizens. Uh, they don't always act in accordance with what the citizens want. No, no. After we've seen that in the state house in Boston. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, the thing that I really didn't like is um, this was kind of like a first reading. I'll have to get a copy of it, and and um, you know I, I didn't do a good job on uh, my uh, my press my press requirements uh, to WHAV because uh, you know I couldn't. I really didn't get a copy of the thing. I might have been able to discuss it more. But the thing that uh, I did, wasn't too happy with is. Uh, Councillor Jajuga, oh, he was all bent out of shape because of this particular thing. And uh, Nikki Songers is a, a, a congresswoman. She does a fine job, and I want to leave. It, we should be leaving it up to them. And I that immediately turned me <laughs> turned me to the public participants' uh, position because they don't always do what we ask them to do. You know that right. time and time again. Correct. No, absolutely. Absolutely, and I'm sure that when you worked in city in in state government, you probably found your bosses had to make certain decisions not based on your recommendations, but on uh, political situations. Uh, that's happened to DEP, re- really. Yeah, we able we in the old days we was, we were able to do our job. Now does nowadays everything of what they think is important has to go to the governor, well, under the previous governor, had to go to the governor's office for uh, for approval, probably not, so, the, <laughs> so that they wouldn't uh, alienate the National Gun Club or whatever you want to, you know. But it was interesting. I'll get a copy of that document because uh, one of my uh, one of my favorites uh, got elected, uh, Jennifer Canan, got oh, reelected that's right. after that's right. she, she was out and she's uh, because she ran for mayor, she lost her chance to go on the council, yeah, right? Yeah, but she, since that time, you know, she's worked. She's worked on her her degree in uh, business entrepreneurship, and uh, and in fact, I think next year she graduates from Lowell University. 
Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Good. Good for her. Uh, hey, yes, uh, I, actually, you, know, I, uh, I, uh, you know, kudos to her for doing it, because uh, I think that she will run in the future for mayor, and she'll academically, uh, she'll have both academically, uh, academically and experience, uh, you know, for the job. That's so. right, and, and Zani's in his last term by, by ordinance, is that right, by charter? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Jerry, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I just want to work something in before we go off. Uh, we had a conversation, I don't know if you heard it, uh, with Reverend Frank Clarkson. And yes, I, uh, I, I didn't hear it. Uh, all right. Well, we it was talking about uh, Haverhill, Haverhill uh, Universalist Unitarian Church uh, had a banner up uh, saying that it affirms that black lives matter. And it was torn down by vandals. And oh, a, that's a, terrible. A writer... Um, whose comment didn't get posted right away because I'm the one who moderates them and I was busy talking. But so I've just posted this comment by Bill, and I just want to read it to our listeners. Uh, he wrote this under the, uh, under the TV screen at whav.tv. I'd, uh-huh. add, I'd add to this thoughtful discussion on the Black Lives Matter movement by mentioning that it's not a uh, one-issue movement, a reaction to new stories of police brutality. Black folks experience inequality in many of our social structures income and wealth, education, health care, etc., including right here in Massachusetts and in our culture as well. Now, it was a, it was a good discussion, and um, I see uh, HCTV, uh, our local TV station, started late with us and left early. So, uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. So, um, uh, well, maybe next week uh, we'll talk and, and we'll analyze that statement, too. Boy, that is a what you call a far-reaching uh, statement. I, I'm sure that many of the uh, premises are uh, uh, maybe correct, but I really, really want to hear more about it, the numbers I'm talking about. You know. Okay, sure, I'd like to do that. Uh, Jerry, as always, Happy New Year. Thank you for staying so involved with uh, the Open Mic Show, and uh, I look forward to talking with you next week. Yes, and I look forward to talking to you next week also. Have, right. a, have a good, have a good year. Let's have a really good. Let's year. have a good year. Let's have a better one than last. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, folks. Uh, that will do it for the open mic show. Uh, we'll be back next Monday night, six thirty Monday night Eastern time. If you're watching in another time zone, a lot of Haverlites have gone across the country and across the world and still tune in to the open mic show. Look forward to seeing all of you then, and uh, maybe you'll participate in one of the contests then. Have a good night. Open mic! Join Tim Coco live on the open mic again next Monday night at 6.30. The opinions expressed on the open mic show are not necessarily those of WHAV, its underwriters or affiliated stations. The open mic show came to you from the Edwin V. Johnson Newsroom.